Okay, can everyone hear me without the mic? Yes. Or do I need the mic? Okay. Uh, I think it's okay, right? This is recording, right? Okay. So let me know if you cannot hear me from the back. Okay, good morning, everyone. So uh, glad to be here in uh, KL this morning. Uh, I just landed in uh, KL uh, from Singapore. I took the earliest flight uh, at 7 a.m. So I'm Eileen, I'm the lead research scientist of uh, Jewel Payment Tech. And uh, I noticed that the schedule actually have my boss name with uh, Paul Condilis. Uh, he's the CTO of Jewel Payment Tech. Okay, so um, just a show of hand, who was here for PyCon 2018? Do you attend uh, Paul's talk at that time? Okay, yeah, so he gave a presentation, uh, also a sponsored talk uh, by Jewel Payment Tech uh, last year. So uh, I will be going through uh, some of the uh, use cases of financial risk management uh, that we have applied with uh, deep learning uh, in our company. Okay. So let me go through the content that we're going to cover. So Jewel Payment Tech is a... Uh, 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 looking into uh, the securing and creating trust in the digital e-payment space. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Which one can I use? Hello. Hello. Okay. So, given the growth of uh, digital payment these days, nowadays, I think since I landed in KLI2, I haven't used any cash yet. So all of the transaction has been e-payment. So there is a tendency when this happens, especially the growth of e-commerce, there is also an increase of fraud. So uh, what are the conventional fraud prevention manners? They are normally manual. There is a team of um, fraud experts that looks at all these transactions. Normally these are very costly and uh, it takes a lot of time to adapt to the fraud patterns in a timely manner. So our team here uh, in uh, Singapore, uh, which consists of, uh, these are some of my team members here. Uh, we have a few uh, data scientists. Um, and we are looking at how to use the concept uh, from artificial intelligence, namely neural networks, and as well as autoencoder to look at the capabilities of uh, fraud scoring. Uh, and also another area that we also look at is in terms of uh, how do we detect merchants that are deceptive. Okay. So uh, I have our colleagues here also, we have a booth outside. So these are, if you have already talked to some of them yesterday, these are some of the products that we have. Uh, mainly uh, for today, I'm going to work through uh, these two main areas, which is the first one to identify uh, fraudulent transactions, and secondly, to look at the marketplace monitoring, which is to identify what are the risky items that have been uploaded to the marketplace. Okay? These are product listings that uh, people are selling online, uh, we are looking at what are the items that are risky, such as weapons, whether it's a counterfeit product or it's an uh, unlicensed uh, pharmaceutical product too. So you can find more information about the product from our website. So first of all, uh, we'll go into the area of uh, fraud detection or fraud scoring. So when you make an online e-payment, right, what do you expect? and what do you experience from this uh, e-payment. So consumer, of course, they always want to look at something that is easy, that is fast, something that customized to what type of a uh, type of a product or what type of a, mm, sorry. Okay, I hope this can survive. Okay. okay. Uh, and also um, mobile and ensuring that the options are dynamic according to their uh, personal situation. And of course, uh, consumers do not want sorry, to be part of the fraud detection process. Okay? 
And uh, irrespective of what type of uh, AI model that you use, um, there will be a very rare chance that you can be 100% accurate. Because fraud normally happens in a very, very, uh, uh, in comparison to the total number of transactions that is taking place, fraud probably uh, entails about 0.01%. Okay? From our data and from our gathering of our transactions, we have about, um, for the last 15 months, uh, for one particular uh, service payment provider, we only notice about 500 transactions that are confirmed to be charged back from the bank. So you can imagine the amount and the proportion of fraud is very low. Yeah, but then, once this uh, charge back are received by the bank, they are actually very costly. So that's the thing that motivates uh, this uh, uh, area and this product. And uh, of course, uh, this involves also security check. These are common uh, experiences by the e-commerce users. Um, when there is a involved security check, so you have to enter an OTP. So uh, at times, it will increase their frustration and also cause uh, people, uh, customers to abandon their shopping cart. And also when your card has been declined due to false positive, so in this case, this is related to uh, you actually have a legitimate transaction, but it has been flagged as uh, a fraud. So this will also cause uh, frustration in terms of the user. And experiences that uh, is also quite commonly encountered is uh, in terms of the phishing email. So all your, when you, let's say for example, you get an email that was actually a phishing email, but it's actually from uh, the uh, e-commerce, maybe a company, Lazada, asking you that there's a voucher for this uh, 10 year anniversary or something, and ask you to enter your credit card information inside. So there are syndicates that actually go around and fish uh, credit card information through phishing emails also. And of course, uh, once a transaction, when you notice that there is a uh, your card has been misused, uh, this uh, involves a long and lengthy uh, uh, process, okay, in order to wait for your refund, okay. So what are the current set of art that the fraud experts they are working on now? So historically, uh, most of the fraud systems, they are hand curated uh, by these uh, fraud analysts or experts. They are done manually through the transaction logs uh, to identify the fraudulent transactions. So the domain experts, they will actually have to look at uh, what are the patterns for instance, um, let's say they notice a high transaction over a short period of time, uh, keep on coming from a particular card. So it can be as simple as just uh, saying that, okay, this credit card, let's say number one, two, three, is uh, suspicious, and then they will flag this and then block the transaction from this card. So, however, this is a, probably a simple rule to block from country or block from, uh, let's say, a particular IP address or a particular email. But there can be cases where they can be very complex. Okay? Fraudsters are also using technology to, uh, to, to come up with new um, patterns or new uh, strategy to ensure that uh, they are not easily detectable by uh, human or the fraud team. So thus, given the overwhelming number of transactions, so there are huge millions of transactions, and uh, this can actually cause uh, the experts to miss some of the fraudulent patterns. Okay? So which is why we move into the space of uh, deep learning for fraud scoring. Okay? So in our case, we normally uh, score a transaction um, between uh, with a particular score for the uh, e-payment provider to to evaluate whether and to make a decision whether they want to block a particular transactions or not. So I'm going to walk through um, some basics on neural networks. 
So deep learning in particular has been uh, quite a, the word these days, right? And um, it's actually referring to uh, machine learning algorithms that will uh, allow computational models of multiple processing layers to learn a representation of the data. So what we in our team uh, at Shuo Payment Tech is working on is to look at the representation of the data uh, in particular, what are the, how are fraud uh, transactions being represented? Okay. Um, common use cases for deep learning involves, uh, this is the most popular one, which is the convolutional neural network. So you can notice here that the convolutional layer at each um, step, they will give uh, different types of uh, features to be represented. So for this particular model, in this case, is for images, okay? So some of the features that can be represented from your data set is such as edges, blobs. Uh, coming to a deeper layer, then it will be on the texture. And then finally, at the last layer, you will start to see the, the uh, images that you learn when you train the model will be um, more of an object that can be classified because this, uh, all the images have been represented through this uh, convolutional neural network. So some of the popular deep learning models uh, that um, since the early days is such as the multi-layer perceptron. Uh, convolutional neural network is mainly a uh, quite popular use case uh, for images. Um, recurrent neural network for sequences, time series sequences. Uh, long short term memory is expansion from recurrent neural network as well as uh, some of the deep belief networks and deep stacking models. So I will be, um, so for the common data set that's been used for testing or sort of benchmarking, so when you do a data science 101, the most common data set that you normally see is the MNIST handwriting data set for digits. So here, uh, normally there's a digit from 0 to 9, there's about 50,000 handwritten digits. So these digits, these images, um, when you input it uh, to a neural network to be trained, what you get is vectors representation. Okay, so this is the goal of uh, training a neural network. We always want to have highly separable um, data points so that we can classify it uh, either with a fully connected idea or other types of documents. Okay, so for example, different numbers, uh, different digits can be represented um, in this form. So very generally, I think most of you also know that uh, this is what we will be looking at. The hidden, uh, the neurons or the nodes that is shown in the graph is basically a representation of how our brain works. So especially since for the last uh, one day, you have been learning, you have been taking in a lot of in information, right? You have been uh, receiving a lot of input. So your brain will actually be there will be neurons that are activated okay so this is a representation that um, is the basic and the fundamental for neural network so you have uh, your inputs and then you have a set of weights wet weights here refer to the uh, connections okay in between the nodes and you sum these weights with your inputs and there is the activation function okay this is the common architecture uh, for uh, the nodes in the neural network. Okay, so the neuron will be activated if there is a pattern match. Okay, and through this uh, network, uh, complex patterns can be learned and can be identified. Okay, next we move to introduction on auto encoder. So we use the auto encoder to to reconstruct our input uh, on the output layer, okay? So typically for auto encoder, there is an encoding part and also the decoding part. So the goal or the aim of uh, auto encoder is to 
reconstruct uh, the output in order to get a compressed representation of your feature. So some of the popular use cases for an autoencoder is uh, for uh, classification. You can use it for classification, clustering, and dimensionality reduction is if you have a data with very high dimensions, you can reduce it and compress it for um, uh, any kind of use cases that you want to work on. And for our case here for fraud detection, we'll be particularly looking at uh, using the autoencoder as the anomaly detection. Okay. Um, so we use Python, of course, to build our autoencoder. So here are some of the popular Python tools um, that is uh, commonly in use. Um, in the two main one is the TensorFlow with a, with a wrapper called Keras and also PyTorch. Yeah. Uh, so Python and data science has been so closely associated since a few years ago. And um, of course, there are also other programming uh, language that's been catching up. Um, things like Scala. So R is sort of the past. So currently, the hype is more on Python. And I think Scala is also something that uh, a lot of uh, researchers in the machine learning are looking at. OK, um, so these are some of the, so for building, uh, we go back to the, uh, the knots that we looked at just now. So in order to build um, just a, a normal uh, multi-layer perceptron, just the nodes. This is uh, how Keras normally, uh, we normally use uh, the Keras models. Okay, we will have the sequential. Sequential here refers to actually a linear stack of layers. So imagine if you have uh, multiple layers, you just add on to this uh, sequential model here, okay? And from Keras, there's also layers, okay? There are many different types of layers. The, the basic one is the dense layer, okay? Which basically is the, the plot that I showed in the previous slide, which is the output is equivalent to the activation function of the weight multiplied with the uh, input. Um, and also, there is also a bias variable there, okay? And of course, you add the dense layer. So this is the one with the three hidden nodes, okay? Given that your input is of the size four, and you can use uh, some of the activation function that is available. Um, for this case, this is a ReLU activation function. So what it means is if your input is below zero, uh, they will all be suppressed to zero, okay? And if it's more than uh, zero, then it will just follow a linear path, okay? And uh, the next layer that we look at here has uh, four outputs, uh, four nodes, okay? And you can define it as an activation layer, a sigmoid, okay? So this is a sigmoid function, okay? Basically what a sigmoid does is uh, it will just suppress all the output from uh, into between zero to one, okay? So if you can see, this is your X, right? your input, and this is the Y. So a sigmoid, what the sigmoid does is just to suppress, this is from 0 to 1. So it will suppress whatever your output or whatever your weighted, uh, weighted sum is uh, into between 0 and 1. Okay? And then the next step is to compile this model uh, into, uh, you need to define what is the loss function that you want to use. So for binary classification, the commonly used method is uh, through a, a binary cross entropy. Okay. So the uh, P here refers to the, uh, the what you get from the network, the output from the network, and Y is basically your ground truth, which is your label. Okay. So the goal of uh, learning a neural network is to minimize this uh, function. Okay. And uh, there are also uh, various uh, algorithms of optimizer. 
uh, such as uh, ADEM uh, optimizer. And you can define the metrics here as the accuracy. Okay, so this is to get your model before you start training. Okay, start training you will use the you call the function model dot fit. Okay, and then you define what is your training set, what is your testing set, and validation set. And of course, there is also the number of epochs that you want to learn. Okay. So that is how you uh, design the basic MLP. Okay. So we go back to representation learning, which is our autoencoder. Okay. So here you can design your autoencoder with the, the encoder part here. We have uh, two, three dense layers here. Okay. Um, actually, four. Yeah, four. So you define what is the encoder, decoder, autoencoder dimensions that you want. So you have a set of inputs that you don't know what is the dimension size. And then you have, for instance, uh, four, uh, four hidden units for your first layer of encoder. Okay. Which you can define it as the activation of a 10 hedge. Okay, 10 hedge is suppressing your uh, output of your activation of your function to negative one and one. Okay, and for this particular example here, we add in a regularizer. A regularizer. Okay, you can see that this is a L1 regularizer uh, with a value of 10 to the epsilon negative 5 which is a very very small value and the purpose for this regularizer, uh, regularizer is to prevent uh, overfitting okay we want to ensure that the weights that are updated does not uh, uh, the, the training does not overfit uh, from the input data okay and normally the in between representation is uh, defined uh, this this is just an example it doesn't have to be half of the encoder and decoder size and also the activation function of the, your choice it also can be uh, depending on the type of data that you have okay so that is how you uh, auto encoder design looks like so how do we get the representation which is from the the compressed feature learning here that we we see okay so you can actually get it back from the layers that you have defined just now okay so you can add it back to a new uh, model which you can call it as hidden representation and after that you will use this uh, new model to predict your data okay so let's go through the uh, example for fraud detection so for real-time fraud scoring, we typically will have definitely our credit card payment data, okay, uh, such as your credit card number, what type is it, and of course the purchase detail is the important one, what is the amount of your purchase, what is your shipping address, and of course the card holder information, um, their IP addresses, their identity, their email address, their name, first name and last name, and velocity here uh, refers to we are checking and monitoring uh, certain data elements so it can be your, uh, the amount so whether they reach a certain interval um, occurs for a number of times so we also look at the uh, velocity of these transactions occur okay so i'm going to show a use case from the kegel data set which you can uh, download from uh, kegel website so this is uh, on the credit card fraud detection. So it's a set of anonymized credit card transactions that has been labeled. So it's actually a binary classification, fraud or genuine transaction. Okay. So, um, so the data looks um, like this because um, they have already been transformed. Okay. So there is a PTA transformation for this particular set of data. So that's why uh, besides the amount, all of the variables are actually uh, in the vector form numerically. Okay? As you know that there are features of uh, the credit card transaction, such as your email, names, they are not a numerical vector. So the model um, is not able to learn this unless you transform it to a vector. That is why it's been done for NLP, natural language processing where you currently have the work to vector model now okay 
So looking at the data representation, um, so we use uh, this uh, algorithm called T-distributed stochastic neighbor embedding, um, which is a non-linear dimensionally reduction uh, method to visualize the fraudulent transaction as well as the genuine transaction. So we can see here that it very it sort of like overlaps a lot. So when you encounter this type of uh, data, you you are looking for a way to better represent it so that it is uh, it is easily uh, can be separable by your uh, machine learning model. Okay. So in this case, we'll use our uh, the auto encoder as a form of semi-supervised machine learning method to better learn the data representation. So to train an autoencoder, um, this is already an example I have shown you just now. Okay, you have a, a number of uh, four, four layers, uh, two layers of encoder and uh, two layers of decoder, okay, where you get your model. So then you compile it and uh, define what is the optimizer that you want to use. And then you use uh, also your loss function. So in this case, the loss function is a mean squared error, okay, the MSE here. And then you fit the model with your normal data. Normal data here refers to the genuine transaction, okay. So this is an example of 700 transaction points, okay. And after you train the model, you get your hidden representation and then you can find your, your hidden representation from uh, the compressed features from this uh, hidden representation model. Okay, so, um, so this example is just a very small example which consists of 700 uh, normal transactions okay? for illustration purposes. Okay. And uh, so we do another TSNI plot and we can see that now after uh, using the autoencoder representation, we see the fraud and as well as the normal transaction, we can see a high separability here. So given this, you can also use different types of model, you can use the SVM model to uh, classify whether it's a fraud or a normal transaction. Okay. So looking at this, um, just a summary from this first part, we can use the autoencoder to separate our data. Okay, you can refer to, we can get this data set from Kaggle. And uh, through using our own, uh, this is our real uh, transactions. So we also did some uh, 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 representation from the data set. And you can see that, um, the, the red fraudulent transaction as well as the normal uh, transaction uh, can be visualized in this manner, okay? So the next use case that I'm going to walk through is the marketplace listing uh, use case, okay? So how do we use deep learning for text classification? I think you guys have an NLP workshop yesterday or something like that, yeah. So we are going to look at, uh, of course, for text, it, it consists of sequences, right? So that's why we'll look at uh, recurrent neural network, which is mainly for uh, time series data, strings, things like conversation, okay? Uh, of course, this is also uh, commonly used for uh, stock data as well, but um, Jewel Femantech does not look at stock uh, prediction. So the popular use cases uh, involves uh, speech recognition, uh, video tagging. Okay. So how does the recurrent neural network differ from the multi-layer perceptron? So what you can see here is uh, each of these uh, RNN cell is actually referred to a hidden state. Okay. Hidden state at each time point, which takes into the consideration of the previous hidden state as well as the input at that particular uh, time. Okay, so the name recurrent is because there is a fit uh, back of the hidden state. So the whole sequence of the stream, we can depict it in this manner. So let's say you have a string of words, okay, and you will have a hidden state being represented for each of the words, okay. 
So the next uh, word will receive the state from the previous uh, hidden state. Okay. So there is a problem with this uh, recurrent neural network. Okay. Imagine if you learn uh, a long string of data. Okay. You will find that there is a problem of vanishing gradient. Okay, that will actually cause your weights to be not be able to update it from training. Okay. So that's why a new algorithm that we are looking at is called the long short term memory method. So this LSTM cell here actually consists of getting mechanism. So getting mechanism here is uh, sort of uh, help you remember things that you need to remember and to forget things that you cannot remember. Okay. And uh, so the first one that we are looking at is the forget gate. Okay, so this is actually uh, how you can. There is a sigmoid activation function here. Okay, to to tell you whether to completely keep it or to completely get rid of the information. Okay, so this is from the previous hidden state, and this is the input data. So the next one that we look at is the. Uh, it's called the input get layer. Okay, so in this input get layer, you also have uh, uh, this is the input. Okay, and you have a new candidate value here, which is an updated uh, representation or updated value of the current uh, input. Okay, and sorry. Okay, and the new. Uh, the new candidate value, the C, we will calculate it based on the previous candidate value with a dot product of the forgetting value. Uh, and also we add it with the input get layer and also the new candidate value here to get the final candidate value. Okay, And then we have another one which is called the output layer. Okay. Output layer gating. So this will be a filtered version of, of the data that uh, we have from the input and also the previous candidate layer. Okay. So then you will get a new hidden state here, HT, which is a dot pro, uh, which is a multiplication of uh, the output as well as our activation function 10H. Okay. So this is the concept of uh, LSTM. You can get more reference from this uh, a blog that was written, um, collavgithub.io. Okay. So that is the LSTM cell. So we we'll look at sentences or words uh, with a directional LSTM. So what it does is there is a forward LSTM and also we have a backward LSTM. So when you have a string of sentences, you have context, right? And then sometimes the context does not just match on the forward manner. Sometimes it's also on the other direction, so which is the backward LSTM. So this is, uh, then you have another layer here for hidden layers, and then you do the same uh, calculation to get the, uh, the actual class, okay? So we can depict this with the training set. We learn it. We have an embedding layer here. And then we have our forward and the backward LSTM. So we also use the dropout function because uh, text, when we also pad it with sequences, there can be a very sparse representation. So we will also do a dropout function. And then from here, we will uh, use the fully connected layer to get our accuracy and given that this is a category classification um, we'll use the categorical cross entropy with the testing data set um, I think I'm also quite running out of time so I'm not going to go through this so this is the word representation which is from the NLP lab of uh, Stanford they have come up with this uh, word embedding of uh, all the strings or everything that is from Wikipedia they form a new vector, okay? Um, so these are some of the things on tokenizing and getting the embedding metrics. 
These are the embedding metrics that were used as the inputs to the uh, bidirectional LSTM. Okay. Um, so here we are using. So here is the the word embedding representation from GLOF. Okay. So for the bidirectional LSTM, we use the LSTM uh, layer as well as the bidirectional layer. Okay. So you can basically just embed this uh, LSTM given the number of uh, hidden nodes that you want and then put the bidirectional layer over it and then you can train this uh, as per the normal uh, neural network okay so this is a more complex uh, neural network uh, typically because of all these new parameters as well as all the getting mechanism inside it is about uh, let's say for this particular case we have about 11 million uh, parameters that we have to tune so this includes the weights the biases okay so we will go through um, oh time's up uh, just a quick example we have our text title body text and images from our marketplace okay so this is the goal we want to classify whether to see if there's any illegitimate category so what we found out is that using the bidirectional LSTM model, we are able to improve our benchmarking data set internally uh, with the accuracy of uh, 0.96 F1 score. Okay? In comparison to the naive Bayesian model, which is based on the word count, um, and this is only using the title as the training data set. So I'm going to conclude here. Okay, after a long morning for you guys. So the key takeaway from this, uh, from some of our use cases is that uh, fraud will not disappear, but it will continue to increase. Okay, so that's why uh, in my team here uh, over in Singapore, we continuously look at the research on how to combat this. Okay, and um, they also use cutting edge technology. So that's why we also need to use uh, technology to uh, to model their patterns. Okay. So the key element here is always to have the right data to be accessible. And uh, what we will look at is through the representation learning of the normal transaction, we will be able to identify what are the fraudulent transactions. And as well as looking at uh, word embedding for our uh, NLP use cases. Okay, thank you very much for your time.